So let's take a little bit to review some of what we've discussed so far this week. So in our live in-person lecture, we mentioned this vague idea of what computing could look like, where we basically said a computer is some black box that takes input and maps it to output. We then talked about what the types of those input and output might be, and we resolved that those should probably be strings because strings could be used to represent other things like images or video or audio or numbers or whatever we might want. So if we're going to be using strings as our input type, and strings are potentially going to be representing other things, we might want to know, are there some things that strings aren't going to be able to represent? To answer this question, we're going to need a definition of what we even mean by representation. So basically, a representation is just going to be a mapping from whatever data you'd, you'd like to compute upon to, let's say, binary strings. So the idea here is that if I want to compute on numbers, then I'm going to need to have my data, in this case numbers, represented as binary strings, so strings of zeros and ones. So something to take note of while we're trying to make a representation of, let's say, numbers, is that we need to have a one-to-one -one mapping from the numbers to our strings. The reason for that is we want to make sure that we don't sort of lose some numbers along the way. We want to make sure if we're adding numbers together that every single number has its own string representing it. So that means our mapping needs to be one-to-one, -one, so we don't have two different numbers represented by the same string. So that means that if whatever data we're trying to represent doesn't have a one-to-one -one mapping onto the set of strings, then we're actually just not going to be able to compute on data of that type. Now, if you recall from when we were talking about functions, we said that if we have a function mapping d to c, and that function is one-to-one, -one, then we can conclude that the size of d is going to be less than or equal to the size of c, basically because every single thing in the domain needs to map to something different in the codomain. So we need to have at least as many things in the codomain as we had in the domain. We also said that if that function was an onto function, then that meant that the size of d had to be at least the size of c, since everything in the codomain was mapped to by something in the domain. We had to have at least as many things in the domain as the codomain. And if it's bijective, then both of those things must have been true, so therefore the sizes of those two sets had to be equal. Now this was apparent for finitely sized sets, that these inequalities were going to hold based on those functions. And what we can do is we can think of this also as applying to infinite sets when we're trying to do representations. So we can only do a representation of our data if there can be an, a one-to-one -one mapping from the data to the strings. So in other words, we're only going to be able to represent our data if the cardinality of the set of data is less than or equal to the cardinality of the set of all strings. So this is now a sensible question for us to ask, even if both sets are infinitely sized. So let's check on the natural numbers then. Can we represent all of the natural numbers with strings? So I actually am going to show that the cardinality of the natural numbers matches the cardinality of all the binary strings. So the first thing that we're going to do is let's look at how we know that the cardinality of the natural numbers is less than or equal to the cardinality of the set of binary strings. So to do this, we need to show that there is some way to represent every number using binary. So if we can show that we can take any number and map it to a binary string, then that's going to imply that there are at least as many binary strings as there are natural numbers. And we do this all the time. We can represent numbers in binary with strings, no problem. So binary representation of numbers is such a one-to-one -one mapping. So therefore, we know that the, number of, that the number of natural numbers must be less than or equal to the number of strings. The opposite direction is, is a little bit trickier. So to show that the number of strings is less than or equal to the number of natural numbers, what we're going to do is we're going to think of this mapping as kind of 
listing all of the binary strings. So to show that the number of binary strings is less than or equal to the number of natural numbers, we need to find some way to map every single binary string to some natural number. So you can think about this mapping as sort of a list. That the first thing, the first binary string, is going to be mapping to, let's say, 0. The second binary string is going to be mapping to 1. And then the third is going to be mapping to 2, and so forth. So if we can provide some sort of way to construct a list of all of the strings, then that list is going to be a mapping to demonstrate the number of strings is less than or equal to the number of natural numbers. So one way that we can construct all of the binary strings is we could say that like the empty string is a binary string, and then you could take any binary string and uh, put a 0 or a 1 at the front of it, and that is a new binary string. So every single binary string is going to appear somewhere in this tree, where each node in this tree represents one binary string, and then its children are going to be generated by putting a 0 or a 1 in front of each of those nodes. So hopefully you can see that every single binary string is going to be somewhere on this tree. So now what we can do is we can use this tree to build our mapping from binary strings to natural numbers. And basically the way we can do this is just by, num by labeling each string with a number in sort of level order through this tree. So the empty string is going to be represented by 0, by the natural number 0, and then the string 0 we can represent that with the natural with the natural number 1, and then the string 1 with the natural number 2, 0, 0 will be 3, 0, 1 will be 4, and so on. So now since this tree, if we were to carry on long enough, would include any natural number that we cared about, and we could number things while we're building that tree, we're going to be able to label every single string with some natural number. So that means that this is a mapping from binary strings to natural numbers, which allows us to conclude that the size of the natural numbers is at least that of the binary strings. This completes our proof of the claim that the size of the natural numbers is equal to the size of the binary strings. So what we just showed was that the set of all strings is what we call countable. Countable is this term that means of cardinality less than or equal to that of the natural numbers. So we say that some set is countable if the cardinality of that set is less than or equal to the cardinality of the natural numbers. An equivalent statement is that a set S is countable if there's a one-to-one -one mapping from S to N, or a set is countable if you can represent elements from that set using natural numbers. You might also hear this term countably infinite. So basically we say that a set is countably infinite if it is both countable as well as infinite. So the natural numbers are countably infinite and the set of all binary strings is countably infinite. Something else to take note of is that all finite sets are countable. So since countable just means the cardinality is less than or equal to that of the natural numbers, any finite set's cardinality is less than that of the natural numbers, so all finite sets are countable. So as a corollary here, since the cardinality of the set of all binary strings is exactly equal to that of the natural numbers, all countable sets can be represented by binary strings. So right now, we've already established that any set with a countable number of elements in it can be represented by binary strings, so this already sets up a lot of the possibility for what we can do with computing. So we're going to start next week by looking at sets that are not countable. So we call those uncountable sets. So we're going to provide some examples for those and talk about what that means about computing.